And it comes from one verse in Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. We'll dabble into chapter 2 a little bit later. <clears throat> but let's read Philippians chapter 1. It's only one verse, uh, so I won't ask you to stand uh, just for calisthenics sake. But Philippians 1.27 says this, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. A gospel worth striving for. Heavenly Father, thank you <clears throat> for your word. I pray that you would speak through me tonight as I deliver this short message on this powerful idea of, of a gospel worth striving for. Be with us tonight in the meeting. In Jesus' name, amen. How many have been to Washington, D.C. and have seen the Constitution and, and all that stuff? If you, if you haven't, you need to put it on your bucket list. That was one of the most incredible things I've ever done. And, and I didn't think it would be, honestly. Uh, we, it was like 8 o'clock in the morning several years ago when we got to the mall, uh, the D.C. mall there, and we went into the first building that was closest to where we had parked, which happened to be the archives building, which had the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. And just walking up to it and looking at it, I wasn't expecting this. I got emotional. I mean, it like, it stirred me. And, and, and just to think of, of what was built on those documents is incredible. And to think. How far we've drifted from those ideals is also incredible. Man, it was moving. And, we got, and what makes it so moving, what makes the Constitution so amazing, is that it has been the authority for this entire nation for over 200 years. By comparison, France, <clears throat> uh, after their uh, revolution, France has had 15 constitutions in the same amount of time. I guess we don't, we do, we, I, maybe being an American, you just assume, yeah, a country forms itself, makes some kind of a constitution, and, and there you go, it's got one. But that's actually not how it works. It is highly unusual that a country would last this long under the same guiding documents. It's impressive. It is, it is a, 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 an indication of the providential hand of God at work in America. And, and it's just an incredible thing how amazing it is that we've operated that long under these documents. Our world, in our world, <clears throat> that's truly amazing because even the best ideas presented with the best of intentions eventually lose steam and die out. Even the best ideas. <clears throat> and yet, after 2,000 years... After 2,000 years, the church that Jesus built is still going strong. You think the Constitution is something. The Constitution has nothing on the local church. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's amazing. That's amazing. Jesus was not the only revolutionary man of ideas that came on the scene during that time before and after whose ideas have faded into history. Yet his have not only stood the test of time, they've shaped our world, they've shaped our lives. We're here because of Jesus Christ and what he did 2,000 years ago. I'm telling you, that's incredible. That is incredible. How how is that even possible? What prevents, what prevents these ideas from dying out? What's been the secret of its longevity, the church's longevity? And how did, uh, 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 how did it never lose focus? These are good questions. Well, aware that circumstances might prevent him from returning to Philippi, Paul used this little section of the letter in chapter 1 
to present to the Philippians, uh, he presented to them the appeal of his heart for conduct worthy of the gospel. He says, look, it's, a, it's an amazing thing that the gospel... Now, they're at the beginning stages of the gospel, but it's an amazing thing that the gospel has been entrusted to us. And if the gospel, if this mission, Paul said to the Philippians, if this has been entrusted to us, there ought to be corresponding spirits and thinking and, and, and actions that go along with that gospel mission if it is to continue. And, and, and Paul is impressing upon the hearts of the people at Philippi this idea that the gospel is worth striving for, worth striving together for. And so he, he lays out conduct worthy of the gospel. This is the first hint that there might have been a little discord in the Philippian church. Probably it wasn't noticeable when Paul was around because the church was unified behind the leadership of Paul. But he, when he was not there, their reason for unity evaporated. I gather from the personality of Paul, he was probably a very powerful man in personality. That just kind of comes across that way. He, 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 he was very wise, uh, trained at the feet of Gamaliel. I mean, the man knew his stuff and probably his presence in a room demanded attention, right? You probably imagine Paul like that. He's, I, I don't picture him uh, as, a, as a quiet-mannered sort of person, though I do picture him as one of the most godly men to ever live, right? And so here's Paul, and you can imagine... If there's a problem with discord or disunity in a church, it evaporated when Paul was there because he's the one in charge. It's like when mom and dad go off on a date and we say, okay, everything looks good. Elijah, you're in charge. I'm, we're going to go out. And, and it'll be in the middle of dinner. Boop, 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 boop. The phone's ringing. Boop, 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 boop. One of my sons wants to FaceTime. Dad, Elijah won't let me. Blah, 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 blah. Does anybody else know what I'm talking about? <laughs> it's like the parents leave and, and there's, there's this discord begins to seep in. And there was a little bit of that happening at the church at Philippi. They were all good when Paul was there to lead. But you get down to the end of the book of Philippians, Philippians chapter 4, and you learn of people like Iodia and Syntyche who couldn't get along, right? You guys are a li lively crowd tonight. You're, uh, you're all afraid this business meeting is going to go so long. Just stick with me. We'll be done here in a second, okay? <clears throat> stay awake. Stay with me, all right? So there, there's, there's in indications that they needed a higher purpose to unify them that would be greater than Paul because Paul wouldn't always be around, right? And every church needs that. There are no more apostles. And I don't care how much you like one pastor to the next or, or the fall, whatever. Every pastor is different. Every leader is different. And a church has got to follow something more than a man. And so Paul says we need to think about what we ought to strive for. Conduct that is worthy of the gospel. <clears throat> the kind of, this kind of church that, that, that follows a man needs constant attention to keep it properly, uh, to keep it running properly because nobody seems to grasp their purpose but the pastor leading. That can't be so. A, pas the, a pastor ought to be one of many helping to reach the goal, not the only one that understands the goal. All right, that was good. That was good. I was, I was about ready to do one of these. Amen, pastor. That's right. That's right. But I think you're getting it. The pastor just needs to be one of many who understand the goal, who are working with everybody else to get there, not the one leading the goal because nobody else knows the goal. We all need to be on the same page. <clears throat> they were unified. A church that operates this way is in trouble because they're unified around a man and not a purpose. So here, Paul seeks to change that. Whether he was there with them or absent. Do you see that? He says it right there. Uh, <clears throat> um, uh, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I am come 
and see you, or else be absent, whether he's there or not. He wanted them unified around a purpose greater than any man and greater than any cause for discord. The things that unite us, church, are far more important than anything that may divide us. Okay, all right. Well, we need to say that again. Maybe you're just thinking about it here. Okay, breathe. The things that unite us ought to be far greater than anything that divides us. Because what we're united around is our faith in Jesus Christ. We're all going to heaven if you believe in Jesus Christ. Which means not only are we brothers and sisters in Christ here, we are brothers and sisters in Christ for all eternity. No one in here, from me on down to the youngest kid, no one in here is ever going to fully understand everything they ought to understand about our God or this book. Hopefully we get a lot of it. Let's hope we get most of it. But that doesn't matter. Because if we believe in Jesus Christ, that thing unites us and it's greater than anything else. I mean, I'm feeling like I need to dive deep. Here, I, little secret, little secret. If you respond, the message goes quicker. <laughs> it does. Because as you respond, and I know you get it, and I know, oh, okay, they got that point. Let's move on to the next one. If they're not, it's like, oh, let's stop. Let's dig a little deeper. Dig a little deeper, all right? But if you read in the book of Ephesians, when Paul is trying to describe the things that unite the church, and he, and he says things like this. In the church, there's neither bond nor free. There's neither Jew nor Gentile. There's neither barbarian or Scythian or anything else in between. All those differentiations, which meant something during their age, they don't mean anything in the church because the thing that unites us is greater than the things that divide us. Amen. Yeah, amen. Amen, and if it's not true, we are in trouble <clears throat> because the devil wants to take every difference and make them a mile high and, uh, and overlook the fact that Christ is that unifying king, the king of kings who rules the church. Okay. Moving, around, moving along, the things that unite us are far more important than anything that may divide us. So what one purpose stands above the rest as our chief unifying factor, that glue? And what are the marks of a church that is striving for this purpose? What are the marks of a church striving for its essential purpose? Well, I'm glad you asked because there's at least three that I can see in this one verse. One is a gospel-driven mission. What are the marks of a church that is striving for the right purpose is that it has a gospel-driven mission. Amen, Pastor. <laughs> That's what a church ought to be about. It ought to have a gospel-driven mission. The gospel is our core purpose. Would you agree? The gospel is our core purpose. Paul begins verse 27 with the word only. It's the, it's the Greek word monon. It means at its root alone, by, it, by oneself, without a companion. The force of the word only is tremendous. As if Paul said, this one and only thing should drive your lifestyle. That's what he says. Only let your conversation. <clears throat> this one and only thing should drive your lifestyle. Nothing else must distract or excuse them from this great objective. It must be their all-embracing occupation, whether Paul was there or not. It says only, manan. This, he's using a big word. Only this, the big one, right? Well, what is it? It's the gospel. The gospel is our core purpose. The gospel is also our core belief. Notice towards the end of the verse, he says, for the faith of the gospel. It's an interesting phrase, isn't it? We ought to strive together. He doesn't simply say for the gospel. He says we ought to strive together, work together, work in unity and harmony. We ought to do it for the faith of the gospel. The faith of the gospel. What does that mean? <clears throat> it means this. Let me ask you this. Do you have faith that the gospel works? That, that, 
that salvation by grace through faith when presented to a person, if they receive that message, that they are saved? Do you believe that the gospel changes lives? Then you have faith in the gospel. And so he says this, for the faith of the gospel, for, for my faith that I've placed in the gospel itself, we ought to strive together because the gospel works. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Okay, well, you're getting it. We'll move even quicker. All right. This is our, this is, this, the gospel is our core belief. It is our core belief that the gospel changes lives. It is our core belief that the gospel changes lives. If we have faith that it changes lives, then it's worth striving for. The gospel is our core purpose. It is our core belief. It is our core drive. It, it says striving together. That's an interesting word. It is the word sunath, if I can say it, sun athleho. Sun athleho, the Greek word sun athleho. It means to strive at the same time with another. Not at another, by the way, right? To engage in a contest, contend in public games, contend for a prize. Uh, it, it, the best illustration I've ever seen is in a tug of war thing. You ever seen guys do, or girls, whatever? Well, hey, equal opportunity here. Tug of war. You know, you all pull at the same time. You ever, you ever feel the strength of a team of people pulling on the other end? It's weird because you get the sensation like there's no way that I've got the strength to do this. But when everyone pulls together, it's amazing the strength a team can have when they strive together to pull. And you know what? We strive at a lot of things in life, don't we? We strive to pay off our bills. We strive to save for retirement. I mean strive, like work extra and stay later. And, and, and we strive for that car or that, that RV or whatever it is uh, you're into, a fishing rod or I don't know, their thing. Whatever things there are, you know, we strive for those things. We strive for our sweethearts. I'm telling you what, I strove to get that one on the back. It cost me a lot of money and time <laughs> in college. Four years of pursuing and writing letters and being creative because there were a lot of other suitors who would have loved to have swept her off her feet, but I won, I won because I stri strove the hardest to get her, all right? I mean, I'm saying we strive for a lot of things. You know what we ought to strive for? The gospel. The idea of striving, okay, can I say it to you this way? <clears throat> Let me put it to you this way. To put it another way, it's worth more than convenience. Sometimes we give the gospel convenience. Well, I've got time. I've got time to be at church tonight or this morning. My weekend's free. You know, nothing's going on. I can give that person a track. That's like, that's convenience. It's not what you would consider striving. But the gospel is worth striving for. Why? Because it works. It's the gospel that changes lives. You get in the message? Here's the marks. Here's the, the marks of a church with a purpose that will last another 2,000 years, with or without a Paul to lead them. Here's what it is. <clears throat> they need a gospel-driven mission. But secondly, in the same verse, we see a gospel-driven unity. <clears throat> you know, Satan's strategy has always been to divide and conquer. Always from Adam and Eve. Divide Adam from Eve. You know, I don't think that ever would have happened if Adam and Eve were together at the same time. But that old devil, he separated them, waited for an opportunity. That's Satan's tactic. He divides and conquers. Nothing so mars the gospel testimony as disunity among God's people. Wouldn't you say? <clears throat> Nothing so mars the gospel testimony as disunity among God's people. Contentious Christians discredit the message they profess to love. I don't mean to be contentious as in finding an answer to a question, but to fight for the sake of fighting. Do you know what I'm saying? I ought never to be. That ought never to be the case, right? We need a spirit of cooperation, not a spirit of contention. So how do we accomplish that? Well, he highlights this. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast. Now listen to this. Here's some unity. In one spirit. In one spirit, right? <clears throat> it is possible. Can I say this? It is possible. In fact, it is typical to be unified in working towards a goal without being unified in the spirit with which you work. What does that mean? 
Okay. This week, yesterday, my son, he's a hardworking young man, put in a good nine hours. And there were, <clears throat> there were uh, two bussers at the job, but, uh, but really there were only one. <laughs> and I'm thankful it was you. If it's ever not you, you're in trouble. <clears throat> Nonetheless, he was working hard. He's working hard there. And, and the boss noticed that it's like we're only working with one busser today. And yet there was another guy there working. You understand? I mean, they're all striving for the same goal, but they're not all doing it with the same spirit. I think you could say it this way. It is possible that your boss or your company, company is more passionate about your job than you are. Yeah. <laughs> all right? I, I, I'm just trying to say, you can strive for the same thing and not all be unified in spirit. It makes a difference. It makes a difference, right? <clears throat> we need to be of one spirit. I need to find out where I left off so we can continue here. Okay. Oh, we typically reserve our greatest passion or spirit for our own ideas. How then can we achieve this level of unity? It's natural that we do that. It's natural that we give acceptable passion. By the way, by, the Bible says, whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. We ought to give our best for our bosses and our parents, amen, and our teachers and whoever else. We ought to give our best because we're Christians. But the natural uh, uh, default mode is to be most passionate about our own interests. That's just life. That's the way it is. We typically reserve our greatest passion, our spirit, for our own ideas. How then can we achieve this level of unity? We must take on the spirit of Christ. He says, listen, stand fast in one spirit. Paul expected the Philippian church to strive for the gospel, not because they wanted to, but because the spirit of Christ drove them to. This does not happen by accident. We got to strive for it. We have to, how do you strive to have the spirit of Christ? You ask Christ, Lord, fill me with your spirit. Let me have your spirit so the things that I wouldn't do, you do through me. Right? We have to yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit's control. And Paul says this, listen, you don't need a great leader to come lead you. You need to strive together. You need to have one mission. That mission is gospel-driven. But you need to have gospel-driven unity. Unity that is built upon the Spirit of Jesus Christ so that you're not all just doing the same thing, but you're doing it with the same enthusiasm. Like we're all enthusiastic tonight. Man, I tell you what, it's exciting stuff. Woo! <laughs> I need to go lead a couple more Pentecostals of Christ. They make the best cheerleading squad. I tell you what, they're, uh, I got so many stories. They're, they're, they're fun. Okay, now, moving right along. <laughs> Not only one spirit, one mind. So first Paul addresses spirit, and then he says striving together with one mind. It's the word psyche. That, that's the Greek word for mind. One commentator said it this way. It refers to the sphere of the affections and moral energies. It points to what we feel about things and how we react to them. It raises the question of what things we consider valuable and what constitutes a worthwhile objective in life. It is a single description of that complex of heart and mind and will. So when he says one mind, he means all of that. Heart and mind and will. That's the mind. It's where those decisions of value are made from. One mind means one ambition, one will. Paul says, here's what you need to have the right unity. You need to have one spirit, be of all the same spirit, that you're not just doing the same thing, but you're doing with the same attitude, have the spirit of Christ, but also be of one mind, that you're all of one ambition, and of one will. That's a tall order, friend. <clears throat> this is single-mindedness. Th this is more than just sharing the same set of doctrines or good communication practice. This is single-mindedness. The absence of all wills but one. I think one of the, the greatest 
um, uh, examples of that is our military. It's a, it, I have great respect for our military who can go into harm's way and due to their, uh, their incredible training can simply be call, told, go take that hill and men will lay down their life without giving it a second thought. Men and women lay down their life to take that hill because the only will that is being expressed is the will of their commander. Isn't that amazing to watch? It, it stirs me up to see old war movies and things of that nature of historic events that happened. Uh, like like D-Day. One day I want to go see the cliffs of Normandy and, and see what happened uh, on those beaches, on Omaha Beach and others. Because men died uh, at the command of their, uh, of their commanders under the most horrific conditions. And they gave up all their wills, all their ambitions, all their, their, their thoughts on what might be best for their life or not to submit to the will of the high commander of, uh, of the American forces and all the other forces that fought. It's incredible. It's incredible. And that is what Paul asks for. Strive together with one spirit and one mind. By the way, <clears throat> this one-mindedness is the chief difference between secular leadership and spiritual leadership. Secular leadership demands strong leaders with strong, articulate wills who can corral the wills of others. Spiritual leadership demands humble leaders with completely submitted wills who can inspire the submission of the wills of others to Christ. Do you want your pastor to be submitted to the, to the will of Jesus Christ? I hope so. I, I hope you're like, I, I don't want to follow a pastor who's not submitted to the will of Jesus Christ. But if I expect him to submit to the will of Jesus Christ, then we ought to consider submitting to the will of Christ that it's led through the pastor. Otherwise, get a different pastor. Right? <laughs> That's kind of how that works. Because you want a pastor submitted to the will of Christ to lead you. Look, that's what differentiates the will of, of, of God be, between the will of the world, right? That You see, the pastor's goal is not to get you to think like he thinks. Certainly not my goal. But to get you to think like Jesus thinks. That's what, I don't want you to follow my will. Let's all follow the will of Jesus Christ. Well, well, what is the mind of Christ? We're all to be of one mind? What's the mind of Christ? I'm so glad you asked. Because it's in Philippians chapter 2. It's right there. You can read it with me. Now, this is a much shorter message than normal. So we're, we're, we're getting ready to land the plane. We're just eyeing the runway here. Okay? So stay with me. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 2 verse 1 says this. If there be, therefore, any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit... If any bowels of mercy fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded. Having, this is the mind of Christ. Having, <coughs> excuse me, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem the other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. The mind of Christ. The mind of Christ to lay down his own life and sacrifice for others. The mind of Christ to esteem us better than himself. Paul says this, here's what you need. You need, first, first point, a gospel-driven mission. And you need a gospel-driven unity. How does that work? To be of one spirit and one mind like that? How does it work? Because the gospel is more important than me. More important than you. I want to see it get done. It's that important. <laughs> I, I was just looking back in the back of my Bible, <clears throat> and there are four names there. People I have had the opportunity to lead the Christ in 2023. I'll never forget 
coming home from Becky. One of these days, we're all going to hear the full testimony of Fuzzy and Becky. I'm telling you what, if you haven't talked to them yet about their past, they're, they're trophies of the grace of God. And I remember coming home from that and seeing someone come from a background like that in tears, except Jesus Christ. As she, as she said right here from this, from this very pulpit, she said, I was in limbo. I didn't know God. And then Pastor Matt opened up the Bible. He showed me how t- that I was completely forgiven. I only need to accept what Jesus did for me. I drove home from that and I told the Lord, I was just overwhelmed. My cup was full. I said, God, I'll give my life to do this every day of my life. It's worth, it's worth more than anything else I treasure in the universe. Just to tell somebody about Jesus. I'd, I'll lay down all my ideas for that. I'll lay down all my passions. I'll lay down all my aspirations. If we can just tell people about Jesus. Church, do you understand? We need to have not only a gospel-driven mission, but gospel-driven unity. Well, where we say, man, I'll step out of the way for the cause of Christ. I'll, I, I'll gladly defer to other people or to, to, to singers who can sing better. or I don't know, people who can vacuum better, whatever the case may be. I'll defer to others for the gospel of Christ because he, he, he deserves all the glory. And I want people to know Jesus. Amen. Okay. Amen. That's good. <clears throat> A gospel driven unity. We need to have the mind of Christ. And finally, there's a gospel-driven lifestyle, and we're done. How do we know we are achieving our goals? What's the measurable byproduct of a church with a gospel-driven mission and gospel-driven unity? It's important. It's a good question, right? What's the measurable byproduct of a church with a gospel-driven mission and gospel-driven unity. Because everyone, is there a church out there that says, oh yeah, we're not about the gospel? I mean, most of, most, every church is going to claim to be that. And I, I, let's make the assumption most churches are. I, I, if I'm just being generous, all right? But there ought to be a measurable way to tell. All right, well, what, what measures do are provided here? Well, A church that has those measurable indications of a gospel-driven mission and gospel-driven unity have a lifestyle of engagement. Because it says this, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Conversation isn't simply talking. It literally means lifestyle, right? Conversation is uh, to live a life conscious of how it makes your gospel message look is to be fully engaged. If we're going to be engaged in the mission and unity of the church, we ought to live a lifestyle. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. The way you live ought to promote the message of Jesus Christ. Pretty straightforward. That shows how you're engaged in the mission. That you don't live one way when no one's looking or when no church people are looking and you live a totally different way on Sundays. No, that we live a life engaged in the mission of Jesus Christ. There's a gospel lifestyle of engagement. There's a lifestyle of excellence. The middle of the verse, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs. Uh, here of yours, it's to earn a reputation characterized by the gospel, right? That is to strive for gospel-driven excellence. If Paul is away from the city and he gets wind and he says, someone comes along and says, hey, did you hear? Did you hear about that church in Philippi? Man, I tell you what, they're always about the gospel. Wouldn't that be an awesome reputation? Did you hear about that little church in Preston? That 124-year-old church, they're still passionate about Jesus. Wouldn't that be awesome? If that was the testimony, I don't want it to, would that be? I think it is, and it needs to remain, and it needs to increase. That ought to be the testimony. So 
not only uh, are, are we living a lifestyle privately, but publicly that spreads. There's engagement and excellence, and then there's endurance, a lifestyle of endurance. He says, uh, whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast. Stand fast, it means stand your ground. There's a, there's a message of endurance there. <laughs> I know you don't know this, but not everyone wants to hear the gospel. <laughs> I'm just joking. All right? Yeah, there, there are places we go where people are not for it. But stand fast. It's one of those marks that indicates this church is living by the mission of the gospel and by the unity of the gospel. So does our lifestyle have these gospel-driven marks? Paul's concern was that the saints at Philippi unite in the task of getting the gospel out. That's what he wanted. The gospel is not an individual's responsibility. It is the responsibility of the whole assembly. If we ever quit believing that the gospel is worth striving for, this, this church will die in purposelessness. But for the faith of the gospel, we can strive together. You know what we ought to want this year to be about 2024 and every year to come? Is that we strive together. That, that we, I don't know what I'm doing here, just kind of making up an illustration as we go. <clears throat> That, 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 we're, that we're locked arm in arm reaching people for the gospel together. And that our commitment to each other is not because I like William so much, but because I'm for that so much. The gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you. Let me see it. We have a gospel we're striving for. We really do. People have been striving for it for 2,000 years, and it's still going strong. But there are plenty of churches that die out for lack of mission and lack of unity. Let's not let that become us. Every head bowed, every eye closed. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you for your word.